Hi there. My name is Luke Kurtz and I'm a digital artist from Toronto specializing in colorful nighttime photography. My editing process is pretty in-depth and time consuming because I pretty much throw my images into the deep fryer. <laughs> This video is my first full walkthrough on my editing process, and it only took me two years of being nagged by my lovely audience. Now my goal with this video is to take those techniques and bottle them up into a form that's easy to understand and follow along to. So in this moment of recording, everybody on earth is stuck inside due to the coronavirus scare. So to keep people from going totally crazy, I've uploaded some of my photos into a Google Drive folder that anybody can download and play around with. As it turns out, being stuck inside during a global pandemic is actually a pretty good time to pick up a new skill. <laughs> It's also a pretty good time to teach a new skill. So if you'd like to practice with that file, or even some of my other photos, you can download them in the Google Drive link in the description below. I will do my best to make sure that link stays alive for as long as possible. First, we want to start off with some simple edits before we get more precise. I normally underexpose my nighttime photos by about one or two stops because I find it's much cleaner to pull details out of the shadows of an underexposed photo than it would be to pull back your highlights from an overexposed photo. I also make sure to enable my clipping warnings so that I've got an idea of how much detail I'm losing in my highlights or in my shadows. I want to save as much detail as possible, so I pull down my highlights and I bring up my shadows, which in effect lowers my contrast. Now this may seem counterintuitive because my style is so punchy and high contrast, but this step is all about making the most out of our camera's dynamic range. So from there, I'll use my whites and my black sliders to ensure that my light sources remain white and that my darkest shadows are a rich black. And I'll add a touch of clarity as well. I rarely move the clarity slider past plus 15 because it's a very strong effect and it can very easily ruin your image. Now the vibrance and saturation sliders will of course help us bring out some of the colors in our image. I actually prefer to use the vibrance slider because it's more selective about the colors that it saturates. It'll intensify the muted colors such as the magenta in the sky, but it'll leave your stronger colors alone for the most part. And I just like the way that it balances out the colors in the scene. I've got a bit of a rule of thumb here. For every four points that I increase my vibrance, I'll offset that by taking saturation down by one point. Now just a couple more adjustments before we take this into Photoshop. I'm gonna use my white balance sliders to bring some more blues into the image in order to cool it down and ideally communicate that this scene is very cold and rainy. Now my last step in Lightroom is to enable my lens corrections, remove my chromatic aberration, and then straighten out the lines of my image using whichever perspective correction feels the best. Now actually, before I bring this into Photoshop, I wanna deal with some distracting elements in the scene, particularly these two signs on the right and all of these red chairs which don't serve anything to the story and actually just take away from the impact of the moment. In photography the viewer's eye is attracted to the brightest part of the image and these two signs are ridiculously bright. The story I want to tell is isolated to this kind of crop which means that I want this area to be the brightest. That way the silhouettes have a much better chance of being the very first thing that the viewer looks at. Realistically my crop at the end will look something like this but I'd prefer not to crop until the very end, which means that I need to take care of these distractions right away. I'm gonna darken the edges of my frame using graduated filters. If I hold the shift key, it'll give me that perfectly straight line. So I'll take my exposure down and my highlights down as well, and I'll stretch out this filter until all of the light blends together. <laughs> so these settings are pretty strong and that's not ideal, but this light is very intense and this seems like the best way to deal with that. On the left side, I'm gonna create a similar kind of filter. And again, holding shift will give me that nice straight line. I want to drag this one nice and wide. The effect I'm applying is going to be pretty strong, so I want to make sure that it feathers out so that this filter won't be too jarring. I'll lower the exposure on this part of the image by a couple stops, and I can already see that I need to make another adjustment here. This is a pretty strong light source in real life, which means that it needs to be pure white in the image. Now maybe that looks white because it's got no color, but when you're judging the brightness of the pixels, it's actually a pretty medium kind of gray. So let's fix that by bumping our highlights. And the side effect of bumping our highlights is that our shadows got brighter, so let's adjust that too. And now that gives me a result that I'm happy with, so let's bring that into Photoshop. Right away, I'm gonna duplicate the layer, and I'm gonna name the bottom layer source so that I know which layer to fall back on. I'll select the second layer and click on Filter in the toolbar, and then click on Camera Raw Filter. Camera Raw is basically Lightroom built into Photoshop. The reason why I'm using Camera Raw instead of Lightroom is because I want to take advantage of Photoshop's masking features, which you're going to see in a minute. Like I mentioned earlier, the eye is attracted to the brightest part of the image. Since I want the viewer to look at the silhouettes, my goal is going to be to brighten the vanishing point. So I'm going to create a radial filter, nice and wide, and increase my exposure by a full stop. Make sure that your feathering is set to 100 and that your effect is applied inside the circle. 
Now increasing your exposure will wash out the image, so we can fix that by pulling down the black slider. Get some detail back in there. Let's also pull down the highlights to bring back some detail, and bump up the whites to keep a full dynamic range. Now I want this area to be a bit more blue, so let's pull the temperature towards the blue side. And let's use the color tool to find something nice. I like that hue, but let's bring down the saturation. Now this is where things start to get a bit more complex, but it's really not that tough. If you're not yet familiar with the tone curve or with layer masking, I'd strongly recommend you watch a five minute tutorial on each before continuing on in this video. I'll leave a link to some good tutorials in the description down below. To simplify things down the road, I'm gonna separate my image into two groups, the silhouettes and the background. This is a group, and it's really just like a file folder that will help you categorize your different layers. So my primary goal here is to turn these two people into silhouettes. And since the image right now is pretty dark, I want to brighten it up a bit so that I can see what I'm working with. So I'll click on the background group and create a tone curve adjustment inside. And I'll click on the silhouettes group and now I'll do the same. I'm going to raise the background curves layer so that I can see what I'm working with. It's important to note that this adjustment is only temporary. Now with our other curves layer in the silhouettes group, I'm going to click on the bottom left hand point and drag it towards the right until the silhouettes are totally black. Now this tone curve is also temporary, you're not rooting your image, don't stress about any of that. So I'm actually going to hide this tone curve by clicking on the white box, which is actually my layer mask, and hitting invert to turn the mask black. When you paint onto the black mask with a white brush, you'll see that you're actually painting in the effect of that tone curve. So I'll take that white brush and I'll paint that tone curve onto the silhouettes. I really want to take my time with this part because the more effort I put into making sure my mask is right, the easier things will become down the road. Now that this layer mask has been painted, I'm going to click and drag it up to the silhouettes group. So I'm moving the layer mask from the curves layer to the group itself. Now by doing this, any adjustments that are added to that silhouettes group will be applied only to the area that we just painted in. Now I want to do the same but opposite to the background group. And the nice thing is I've done the work already. Option click on the mask. Now this black and white image, that's the layer mask itself. That's what I want to copy and paste to the other group. Command A will select the image. Uh, Command C will copy it. And then Command D will deselect. So now we've got that mask in our clipboard. Click to select the background group and give this group its own mask using this button down here. Option click that background mask. And on this white screen, hit Command V to paste that mask. And then Command D to deactivate those marching ants. Invert that mask, and that's it. So it might be confusing why I did that, but in a few seconds, you're gonna see what that does. So now we can delete this temporary layer and pick up right where we left off. The silhouette tone curve was also temporary. I'm gonna click on this bottom point and drag it all the way back over to the left to where it was before. So now I'll click on this pointer finger and bring it over to one of the brightest parts of this figure. Now click and drag that point down. So in effect, this does pretty much the same thing as the last tone curve. But because this tone curve is far less harsh, I've got a few more details in the shadows that I didn't have before. So my goal here is still to brighten that vanishing point. And this will be really easy because we've already done our mask. So let's create a new curves layer in the background group. Now I'm going to go back to this pointer tool. So now I want to find a point around here which isn't too bright, but also not too dark. I think the sky is that right kind of in between. So I'll click and drag that point a little bit up. And then I'll find a darker tone and I'll pull that down to make sure my shadows don't become too bright. So this area is looking a lot better and it hasn't affected our silhouettes, which is perfect. Now there's also something weird going on right here. Whatever's behind that silhouette, I didn't know what that is. But when you look at the image from a distance, it's dark enough to muddy the shape of this silhouette. So my goal here is for the silhouettes to stand out in such a way that the viewer's eyes can lock onto the silhouettes instantly and effortlessly. Which means I don't want any kind of distractions back there. I don't want anything that could potentially interfere with that. So to deal with that, I'll create another curves layer here in the background group. And I'll lift the black point until that area is no longer an issue. And of course, I don't want the entire image to be washed out like this. I want this effect only applied to that immediate area. So I'll invert my mask. I'll take a white brush at 0% hardness, 
and just quickly paint that area away. See, that was a pretty small change, but little things like that can have such a big impact. And as you zoom out, you can really see just how distracting something small like that can be. All right, this next part's my favorite. I think you guys know. So this is where I make the light slow. So this next technique is called the Orton Effect. I did a full tutorial on this with my friend Chris Howe, and if you wanna watch that video, I've linked it down below. Since I've talked about this in a past video, I'm gonna do this effect pretty quickly. Command A will select the entire image. And I'll go into the toolbar and hit Edit and Copy Merged. The reason why we're gonna click on Copy Merged is because we're working with several different layers here. So we wanna make sure that the image as a whole is gonna be copied to the clipboard rather than just an individual layer. So with that image copied to the clipboard, I wanna paste this into the background group above all the other adjustment layers. So this will be the Orton Effect layer. And the reason why we're putting it right here is because we don't want the below adjustments to be reapplied to the layer. And the reason why it's not in the silhouettes group is because I don't want the silhouettes to be affected by the glow. I want them to remain black, I don't want them glowing. So just like in that video with Chris, I'm gonna apply the image, change the blend mode to screen, and then add a Gaussian blur. I pronounced that wrong in the video with Chris. I pronounced it like Gaussian or Gaussian or something. <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised nobody roasted me for it. Anyways, now all of our lights are glowing. And I love that it's got like this soft ethereal touch to it. So I'll create a layer mask on the Orton layer to erase where I think the effect is too strong. And I'll also use the opacity slider to dial back the strength of it. I think it's looking really good so far. There are a few more tweaks that I want to make though. We have some really nice reflections off these streets, so I want to add some more contrast. So I'll create another curves adjustment. I'm going to find the darkest shadows here, and make those black, and then I'll find where the light reflects off the road and make that brighter. And now we've got more of a gloss on the streets, which really adds to the atmosphere. So I'm going to invert the mask and take a white brush with a low flow. I usually use like 15, 20%. And I'll use that brush to just touch that effect into the areas that actually need more contrast. Now up here, a lot of these signs aren't actually lit up, and I would love for them to be on. I think that'll make the street feel more alive. So I'll add another curves layer, and I'll slide the top right point towards the left until it roughly looks like that the lights are on. I'll turn my mask black, and then I'll paint that effect on top of a black mask. This sign doesn't have any lights, and it wouldn't make sense for me to use the same curves layer, but I can still bring that out in a similar way. Now it's time to add a little bit more color, and this is a technique that I've been playing with more and more lately. If you click on the hue saturation adjustment, and then click on the colorize checkbox, you can flood your image with really pretty colors. There's a purple reflecting off the streets, which I really like, so if I hue match it, I think this tool will help me intensify that. Again, I'm using a low flow brush to paint these masks. It gives me more control over the effect because it's very easy to oversaturate these colors. I also want to bring out these reds. They provide a nice color contrast because the rest of the image is pretty cold. I like it. So I do have a few closing notes before we wrap up here. First of all, if you already follow me on social media, you might have seen me post another version of this photo. It's a lot more blue than the one I just created. Now the reason why I didn't teach that technique is because it was experimental and I honestly don't know what I did. <laughs> and that's actually the name of the preset is, I don't know what I did. 
And I know that's a bit of a lame answer, but I do have a gift for you. It's a bit of an Easter egg. Type this link into your browser to download the preset. If you're interested in presets that I put more effort into, you can find them for purchase on my website, lukeandcoots.com slash presets. Special thank you to Al Joshua Constanty, better known as AK for the beautiful background music. And special thank you to you for being so supportive of my borderline deep fried photoshopography. If you'd like to support my future YouTube endeavors, you can do so by liking this video and subscribing because those two little actions can help me more than you know. My name is Luke and Coots, thank you for watching.